Hello. I'm back again. This is uh, ST589, <clears throat> Fundamentals of Information Technology. This is Lecture 7. We're going to talk a little bit in, generally, in general about spreadsheets, a little bit about the history of spreadsheets, and then we're going to talk specifically about your second assignment. For many of you, the second assignment will be relatively easy. Others of you will be difficult, and that's the nature of these kinds of fundamental introductory classes. But um, <clears throat> I would just say that if you want to, if you have questions about something beyond the assignment that you need to do for work or home, you can post it in the forum and I'll try to answer it best I can. Those of you that uh, haven't, don't know much about Excel or don't have much experience, post the questions. That's the advantage of these distance classes. That what's ma it's what makes them work is those conferences. If you have questions, don't wait. Post, post. If I don't answer right away, I'll bet one of your um, compatriots uh, in class, one of your colleagues in class will have an answer for you. So uh, try that. Don't wait. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about spreadsheets. Spread, we mentioned them in one of the earlier lectures, and you should know what they are by now. Spreadsheets, of course, are ways to um, manipulate data. It's an application program talks to the operating system, which then talks to the hardware, including those components of the system unit we talked about. And just as a little review, where does the program, the spreadsheet program, reside? Well, of course, it's on the hard disk. The operating system finds it when you ask it to run it. You click on the icon, <clears throat> finds it on the hard disk, loads it where? RAM, right, and then it executes, puts up a GUI, graphical user interface, and then you start working with your spreadsheet. And like any piece of software, you need to consider what do I want to do before you start working with the software. Uh, many of us think the software is going to do the thinking for us. It's not going to happen. You have to have a plan. Before you go in and open your software, have a plan. Once you're in there, you'll, you'll make much better use of your time, and um, you'll get a much better spreadsheet in the long run. So what about spreadsheets? The history. Well, spreadsheets have been around a long time before computers were invented. A long time. I've got a couple pictures here that I just kind of like to talk about just to bring it home. These are, of course, Pictures from the uh, film of the Charles Dickens novel, novelette, A Christmas Carol. You all know the story, I'm, I assume. On the left, you see <clears throat> uh, Scrooge, the person who is so mean and nasty, and of course, the ghosts of Christmas make him a better person. And you see him with the ghost of Christmas present, I believe, from the uh, original, one of the older versions, probably my favorite. But in any case, on the right, what do you see? But the stage version of the same uh, a novelette. And you see, of course, <clears throat> Scrooge there working away. Next to him, in the background, you see Tiny Tim's dad. <clears throat> Tiny Tim was the invalid kid that Scrooge ends up helping. That's his father there, Bob Cratchit. What's Bob doing there? Did you ever think about it? He's working on a spreadsheet. Yeah, spreadsheets have been around a long, long time. The Egyptians had spreadsheets. So don't think that a spreadsheet was invented when computers were invented. They've been around a long time. We've just figured out a way to use another tool, to use our computer to make it easier. Now, if you think about Bob Cratchit here in his table with his little quill pen, what happens if he spills his bottle of ink on that thing? Well, of course, he's got to start over. And I hope he's got that data written on another piece of paper somewhere, and he can actually start over. If he makes a mistake, what happens? Well, and occasionally, if you look back on these old documents, they scratch it out and put the right answer in, but not often. They generally had to redo the whole page by hand, especially before pencils, of course. <clears throat> you think they did a lot of calculating on these things? No, these were records. What the computer allows us to do with spreadsheets is take it a step further and say, well, what happens with this total if I change this number? But what if I add 1% to the whole column? What's the new total? And the key to using a spreadsheet on a computer, of course, is to use those formulas. 
Use the software, use the tool. We'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> Got a couple of links up here, and I'm going to go over them briefly. Some of them you might be interested in looking at in greater detail if you want to talk to your students, you know, get a little more background. <clears throat> First one here is a, is a spreadsheet that talks a brief history of the spreadsheet. And the computerized spreadsheets have been around more than 30 years. The first viable commercial one was in 1979 or thereabouts. And here are the two geeks. I'm a geek, so I guess I can say that. They invented it. Daniel Bricklin here. And Frank, I can't remember Frankston's first name, I'm sorry. Bob, there it is. Bob Frankston. They were MIT guys, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And um, Bricklin was an MBA, a business person, and he decided one day, wouldn't it be cool if I could actually do these, these things they're asking me to do on some kind of uh, software? I lost our, my uh, page here. Hang on one second. There it is. So he invented something to do that. He invented something called VisiCalc. And Dan Bricklin, Bricklin, by the way, is still around. He owns a, a database company, I believe. And he's still working. I don't know what happened to Bob. But he invented something called VisiCalc, visual calculations. In other words, you can see it in the background of the photo there, VisiCalc. This thing was huge, huge. I mean huge. The uh, computer was just getting popular. It was just getting... Um, uh, really cool. People were just desperate to use it, and about the only thing they could use it for was word processing. And in those days, when it was invented, secretaries did most of the typing, even on the word processors. So businesses bought these computers and had very little they could do with them. So they were they were anxious for something, and that's what Visual, VisiCalc became, a piece of software they could actually run on the, this iron that would justify it a little better in, to the accountants. They actually could run numbers, crunch numbers. So it was a very important product, and it took over the marketplace like crazy. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little more about VisiCalc in a minute. I want to show you what Bricklin's put together as a history, just so you can get a feel for what kind of people these are. Um, and there's some links in here you can go. There's an email about the situations and so forth. I'm not going to bring them up. VisiCalc then was replaced by a product called Lotus123. And it was a quantum leap. And one of the problems VisiCalc had was that it was designed for the Mac. And the PC marketplace exploded. And Bricklin was behind the eight ball when it came to that. There was a guy named Mitch Kapoor. He was the VisiCalc product manager. And he developed a piece of software called Lotus 123. And he went, broke away, started another company. And he started Lotus 123. And you had to say the 123 as part of the patented, copyrighted name. <clears throat> and 123, now, VisiCalc had five columns and 20 rows, I believe. That was it. You couldn't do any more. We'll look at it in a second. Uh, Lotus became almost the generic name for spreadsheets. It was huge. And it was bigger than VisiCalc. In fact, it put VisiCalc out of business. And this is the way the computer industry tends to go sometimes. Something better comes along, especially in the early days, and blows away the other competition or buys them, which is really what Bill Gates is best at, is buying things, not developing them. <clears throat> but he's very good at it. And 123, Lotus 123, was a tremendous product, as VisiCalc was. This one, though, was a more uh, mature product. It had a better graphics interface. It had color. You could just, it just fit perfectly what was going on with the IBM PC. So 123 took off. <clears throat> There's some statistics in, in somewhere um, $156 million when it went public, which doesn't seem like much these days, but at the time it was a lot of money for a guy that started in his garage. And the interesting thing about Lotus, one of the interesting things about Lotus 123, everybody that went to work for them in the early days, and they were in Silicon Valley in California, and everybody that went to work for them got stock options. 
and it's a, it would be a very, if somebody did this a few years ago, did a documentary on all the people that worked for Lotus and what they're doing today. And even the janitor, the maintenance workers, the guys that screwed in the light bulbs got stock, the secretaries. And when they went public, these people became multimillionaires, every one of them. They didn't have very many employees, and they divided it up based on how much stock you had. And most of them <clears throat> did some really interesting things with that money, started foundations, uh, moved to Tibet, and moved into a monastery and supported the monastery. Just a lot of interesting stories. And it would be really an interesting project to research some of those people and see what they're doing today with all that money they made back then. See if they're still, uh, if they held on to their money or whether they've lost it in the current situation or, or just spent it over the years. But it created a whole subculture in, in, in the world and had a, a tremendous impact, this one little company. Lotus 123 is still around. IBM bought them out. And all those people, of course, took the money uh, when the IBM bought the stock. You can still buy it, Lotus. It's usually used on hot, bigger machines than PCs these days. What really keeps the name Lotus alive is something called Lotus Notes, which is a way to uh, send messages between databases, between spreadsheets, between people, between computers. It's kind of an email that allows you to carry stuff simply, and it keeps track of it, keeps the database. It's hard to explain until you've used it, but it's a very valuable product to a lot of businesses. <clears throat> And it was, it just, um, what allows you to communicate with anything to anything, from hardware, software, apps, uh, operating system, anything. <clears throat> and of course, finally at the bottom here, we get down here to Bill Gates, Microsoft, and all the legal battles. And as I said, if you want to know more, there's a lot of links on that page, which you can look at. I want you to see a little bit, just because we're talking history here, um, about these guys invented the first viable um, spreadsheet. <clears throat> and remember, this was done by Franklin, and there's links all over here. I'm going to go to the, uh, notice here, by the way, if you want to see um, how VisiCalc ran, that you can download a copy there that runs on the current Windows, and you can play around with it for free. But I'm going to go to the history section here. And I'm going to go to Software Arts and VisiCal, because that's the company. And we're just going to look at some of these photos real quick. And it's kind of funny that uh, the guy took pictures of himself along the way. He had some idea that what he was doing might be worth something someday. So he documented everything. <clears throat> and um, here are some of his worksheets. And this is what programmers do. We'll talk more about this later. They design things before they start programming. It's only very ignorant people that think all you need is a programmer to write software. That's the last step. That's the easy step. The hard step is the designing part and deciding what you're going to do, thinking of all the possible combinations and planning up front. <clears throat> we'll talk more about that later when we talk about programming languages. And, but you can see here all these diagrams. And he put that to work, made a product out of it. And of course, the old, almost proverbial these days, here's where it happened kind of thing, you know. Apple computer started in Steve Wozniak's garage with um, Steve Jobs there. And notice they're talking to people, the two of them are talking. Here's a picture of this wonderful product that made history. Wow, black and white. Notice there's only four columns here. You can only do one more. But notice it has letters across the top, numbers down the rows. We still use that. So this guy came up with that. I'm not sure how else you do it, but it just became what we do. Letters top, numbers on the rows. That's how we keep track of the cells. The cells are where the rows and the columns intersect. We'll talk more about that in a minute. There's a picture of it. This was in 1979. Um, here's the computer they used. So long ago, they actually worked on a computer without a monitor. I know it looks like what we used to call a teletype, but it's a terminal. It didn't have a monitor. It printed stuff on the paper. That's how long ago this stuff happened. Here's a picture of some of the programming code over here on the left. On the right are the comments. 
which good programmers put in their code, comments to tell the person that comes after them what they're doing and themselves when they come back. And these are actually um, instructions to the machine. And, as I, and we'll talk more about programming later on. I just wanted you to get a feel for this at this point. Another picture. They moved to a storefront. They're getting bigger. And this is one of the big boosts they got early on. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One, they finally got a major sponsor, Pepsi Cola, to talk about how valuable this product is. But you might recognize this guy if you've been around for a while. His name's John Scully. At the time, he was CEO at Pepsi. Uh, I don't know if he was CEO, but he was an executive at Pepsi. He later became CEO of Pepsi. And he, he did a lot of marketing research with BusyCalc. So it finally proved that a big company could use this kind of software. Up till then, PCs were almost seen as toys, not very important, almost like typewriters. It was a big moment in the history of computers and, of course, spreadsheets in general. Well, later on, John Scully here got hired by Apple. The board at Apple kicked Steve Jobs out because they didn't like what he was doing with the company. Even though Steve Jobs was one of the founders, he let go of control. The board of directors kicked him out and hired John Scully here to run Apple years later. <clears throat> it's a small world. And of course, the story, as, as many of you probably know, Scully did okay, but he didn't do as good as they'd hoped. And eventually they hired Jobs back which is when uh, he was working with Pixar, and he took that job at Apple. Eventually, he invented the iPod, or he didn't invent it. <laughs> his engineers and his brilliant people did. But he had the ideas to make the iPod what it is, and it changed, turned Apple around. So Scully was there for a while, but eventually Jobs came back. So it's a small world. Everything seems to be connected. Byte Magazine, which I believe is still around, probably only electronically. I haven't read it in years. 1979 has an article about VisiCount. Not much to say about that. Another picture here of these geeks. Article in the New York Times about VisiCal. Things are getting big. Something in the New York Times again. What I want you to see is as time goes on, they start to change. Uh, their lifestyle a little, and finally they moved to this high-rise building about 1980 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and uh, they're becoming a big company at this point. Then they had advanced versions, other products they worked on. Remember, the marketplace was kind of small in those days. <clears throat> in the end, of course, it ended in lawsuits. <laughs> Mitch Kapoor was at Lotus, and Lotus took over the PC market. VisiCalc started. VisiCalc by then had an IBM version, PC version, but by then Lotus had taken it over so strongly, VisiCalc couldn't compete. And uh, VisiCalc is out of business. If you want to see a running copy, as I mentioned, you can get one off the website here. But just a little history. Um, not much to say about Lotus, other than what I've already said. Notice this is the IBM website, and Lotus is on here. And if you're interested in what Notes does, that was invented by Lotus. And it's really the reason IBM bought them, not the spreadsheet so much. But their spreadsheet is still available. Notice they're out here to release 9.8. But uh, Lotus also has other packages, like graphics, freelance, which I used a long time ago before Lotus owned it. <coughs> Organizer, there's a word processor. In other words, there's a bundle, a smart suite like Office you can get from Lotus. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, we get down to MS Excel, and that's the Microsoft thing we all know about. And Gates pushed the other people pretty much out of the marketplace uh, when, when he uh, started, when he put his focus on it. And Excel is a pretty good product. <coughs> By the way, just just um, for the sake of completeness, a couple other things you might look at, and I've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. Uh, 
at Sun Microsystems, there's a, some software, software suite bundle, as we talked about, uh, called Office Works, which has a, everything that Office has, except it's free. It also allows you to move Office documents into their version and take their versions and create Office versions, so it's a conversion th uh, as well. But something to think about if you want to use something other than Microsoft products. <clears throat> um, another one you might want to look at that's free is Google Docs, which again is a suite of products. And it's free from Google. One of the differences between Google and the others is that Google is all online. So instead of having to mail your spreadsheet to somebody else, you just create it online, Google stores it for you, and you give somebody else the URL, and they can go in and look at the spreadsheet, look at the graphs, change the data if you allow them to. Uh, so it's kind of like a using the web in the, quote, 2.0 version, the idea of collaborating using the web. <clears throat> Google Docs is very good for that. It has a lot of bugs, though. Um, we, we use the scheduler here, the Outlook sort of thing. And it, it works really well for what we needed to, day-to-day -day class scheduling and so forth. It's just that occasionally you get something you schedule and you can't delete it. It's there forever. No matter how many times you delete it, it comes back. You can't change certain things once they're in there. It's, it's nice, but I'm not sure I recommend it. But it's something you might want to ask your students to look at instead of the old office thing, that maybe look at something a little different. <clears throat> it's another tool. And there are a lot of other things out there. Uh, available. And we've seen this slide before. Spreadsheet software organizes data. Actually, the spreadsheet doesn't, does it? No, you organize the data using the spreadsheet, but it is a great tool for organizing your data. It does calculations on the data, and that's the beauty of it. And one of the phrases you often hear with spreadsheets is, what if? analysis. And what if analysis means, what if the interest rate went to six? What does that do to the length of time it takes to pay off the loan? What does that do to the savings? Does that mean I can retire a year earlier? And if you design your spreadsheet to use variables rather than typing in 6% interest, if you have a field where the interest relies, with a formula referencing that field, and we'll talk about this in a minute. All you do is change one field and whoosh, your whole spreadsheet changes. So it's very important to think about that. And here's some examples of uh, calculations. And we'll talk about that in a minute. This is a function, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And you should know by now that a spreadsheet has columns, and they're the letters. Rows, they're the numbers. Where the rows and the columns intersect, we call that a cell. This terminology, nothing fancy, nothing magical about it, just terminology. And notice there's a certain format, the total line you tend to highlight, and we'll see how to do that in a minute. Pretty standard stuff at this point. <clears throat> and a function. Two kinds of functions. Notice the symbol equal. When you type an equal sign in a cell, in Microsoft Excel and most spreadsheets, that's telling the software, telling it's a signal, it's sending an ASCII code, to the application software that says, oh, you want to do calculations. OK, tell me what calculations. And all of a sudden, it shifts to another mode where it's editing what you're entering in terms of uh, mathematical formula rather than just a text field. <clears throat> this is one somebody typed. And this is what I get from a lot of students on this assignment, where you just say, well, I want to add all those columns. But here's an easier way to do it. There's built-in functions with Excel where you can put in a range of cells.
And not only is that a better way to do it, because it's shorter, so imagine if you had 50 of these. There's only five here, but imagine if there was 50. That would be horrible, typing all those. How many typographical errors would you make? So this, the uh, range function allows you to get around those problems, but it also allows you to use the software better because if you insert or delete something within that range, it automatically adjusts this formula. Years ago, Excel didn't do that. And it was a real pain. When you deleted or added a row, you had to go change all your formulas. Now you don't have to do that. It's a great improvement, believe me. And we'll look at that. And of course, you can graph things. <clears throat> X, Y, a line chart here. I call this a bar chart. You might see this as a column chart. Same thing in my mind, okay? Some people say a bar chart goes this way. And these being the bars. Okay? So in the assignment, I'm asking you to do one of these. And you can see it in the example. I believe Excel may now call that a, a column chart. But I'll accept either the bar or the column, whichever you want to do. Here's a pie chart. You've all seen those. Bar chart is used to compare things one to another. The pie chart is as well, but it, the whole pie, of course, is 100% of what you're looking at. May not be true for the bar, bar chart. All right. <clears throat> Real quick, the cell is where your input resides. You type on the keyboard or you use the mouse. You, mouse can be used as input for a spreadsheet, any application, but a lot for the spreadsheet. In the cell, you can input, and as we know, input goes through the application software to the operating system to RAM. Later on, if you click on File, Save, it will be moved from RAM to the hard disk for a permanent copy. For now, it's in RAM. In, there's three things you can put in a cell. One is a label. Example. Um, product. Description. That's something that gets stored, but isn't computed with. It's just stored data. That's a label. Two, well, of course, data. Example, the number eight. Example might also be um, Five percent. You get the idea. That's data. The third thing uh, is a formula, some people call it, or a function. And there's two kinds of those. One is one you put in, or um, user input, let's just say. And the other is <clears throat> machine held, I'm going to call it. Or built in is a better way to put it. So that's one that's within the software, and you just have to call it up. <clears throat> so those are the kinds of things you can put in a cell, nothing else. Like most things with a computer, it starts simple. It's a tool. What you do with it can become very, very complicated, very complex. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's take a look here. Here's an example of Excel. Here's the addresses across the top here for the columns. Columns. And of course, Here's the addresses for the row. So this one, 
would be B2, and so forth. All right, <clears throat> that's the basic premise here. Now, if I click my mouse on B2, notice a couple of things. The address is, well, I can't write on that. But the address is here, up here, B2. You can see it in your screen there. If I type something in here, notice it also appears at the top. It appears down in the cell itself, and it appears at the top. If, your cell, if what you type in there goes beyond the width of the cell, it'll show it to you until I click on C2 here. I need to press Enter, sorry. If I press Enter, I click on C2 here, and I'm just going to type the number 75 and press Enter. So now you see you can't see that label. Well, here's a quick secret. If you go up here, put the cursor right between B and C and double click, it automatically adjusts your column to the widest um, uh, entry you have in there. So now we can see it. Another thing, if I were to make this smaller, put it back kind of the way it was, if I click on B2, you can see the whole value up here and work on it too, if you want to do it that way. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to go now to D2. Changing columns, staying in the same row. If I go come up here to the top and press on this function symbol, FX, I can also click on Insert function does the same thing. I'm going to wait for you to catch up. Here's a listing of all the built-in functions in Excel. Right now, there's a category box here in the center. It's set for financial. And we can go down here, click on FV. That's um, future value, I believe. Yeah, the bottom. Returns the future value of an investment based on periodic constant payments and so forth. So if you want to find out future values, you can use that. And if you click on this link down here, it will bring up help on how to use that. Here's the syntax over here. You need the interest rate, <coughs> total number of payment periods in the annuity. Annuity is a... Uh, um, a document or, a, or an agreement where you're going to make so many payments for so long, how much you're paying, and so forth. And you enter those values, and the FV, it will compute the French, the French, the future value for you. Okay? I'm just going to close that. Uh, I didn't close it, I made it bigger. Okay. Close this for a second. There we go. Again, click on function. Notice we can also change this to other things. The most re recently used is kind of nice because it shows you the stuff you've used recently. You've used in this piece of software. Date and time, all kinds of different ways you can format. And you can do computations with dates. You can subtract one date from another and find out how many days apart they are, those kinds of things. Math and trig, absolute value. Nice if you always want a positive number, degrees, so forth. Um, statistical. Average is probably one you're going to need in the assignment. <clears throat> uh, probably some is in there. Some, some might be in the math. I don't remember. And there's other ones. Database. There's logical. And so forth. <clears throat> That's text. Let's see what the logical one says. There's if statements you can do. If this is not true, if this is true, else. You can set up a whole if-else structure in a cell if you want to. So there's where the functions are. You'll need just basic ones for this assignment. 
Let's see. What else do we want to talk about here? Let's just go through the top um, toolbar. Take a look at file. You can save a spreadsheet as a web page. I do this for some things that we use internally. We have people that do quality control for us around the state. Um, and uh, I have spread uh, a, a, a web page for them that they click, that they can bring up on their browser that shows them what I would like them to review for us with a URL or a link to the FLB file, the flash file, that they download to their computer, they watch it, they fill out a form, I get it. And before you see these lectures, there are some exceptions, but most lectures before you see them, they've passed quality control. And I use a spreadsheet to keep track of it, but I create a web page for them to access it. <clears throat> so I have an internal spreadsheet that everyone here uses, and the web page I create specific for each QC person. And you can do that, save as web page. Of course, it's not that simple. There's more than one kind of web page here. There's a single web page, a web page, there's a, um, some other things too. But you can just save it as a web page and that'll work fine. Of course, you gotta put it on some kind of web server, which we'll talk about later. You can print, web page preview, page setup, that sets margins and things. The print area says what you want to print. You can set the print area. It says you've selected a single cell for the print area. Well, let's just, I'll show you how this works. You just do that, and that means I want to print that. That's very handy if you have a gigantic spreadsheet because you can't print it all. And then you can go back to file, print, and it'll only print that print area. There are some functions later on, especially the web stuff, it'll say you need to turn off the print area so you can clear the print area as well. Properties, <clears throat> if you go to uh, summary, you can, if you should fill out this area, if you're going to convert this to a web page, this is what goes into the title of the web page and appears across the top of the browser and so forth. So you might want to fill out this, this um, area. It also puts in keywords in the web page and those kinds of things that comes from here. When, you, when we find out more about what those are, we can come back and talk about that again later. Edit, pretty, pretty straightforward here. Nothing new here. View, um, pretty normal in the sense that it's the same for all Office products. There's not much uh, specific here to Excel. Insert, well, we can insert a chart, which we'll look at later, a function, comments, which come up when the field, when the mouse goes over the field, do those kinds of things. Picture, you can pull a picture from clip art, which you should know about from your word assignment. A diagram, an object can be anything from a PDF to a um, access database to a PowerPoint, anything you can put in there. And then a hyperlink, and this is how you put a link to a web page. What you see here at the top, So what I'm doing is converting, oops, this is a label, I shouldn't have erased that. Down here is the address. I'm going to put www. Um, let's just go to Yahoo, yahoo.com. If I go to Yahoo, I probably should change this label. This is a link to Yahoo. And I'm going to make this wider by double clicking between the two columns like I showed earlier. Now if I look at that, it's underlined like a URL should be, like a web page address should be. If I click on it, guess what? It goes to Yahoo. That's how you do that. <laughs> There's a bleak scenario for voters, it says. All right, that's under insert. Format, you can format cells. Before we do this, let me go back to the number field here. Format, 
cells, general text, essentially. There is a text, I think, but general just is anything. But if we got a number here, if, if you need to use a comma, you need to click this box. Otherwise, there's no comma on the thousands. Number of decimal points, you can raise or lower it here, or just type in the one you want. Notice it shows you what it looks like here. And then the one we're generally picking for this class is this sort of thing, which is red when it's negative with parenthesis around it. The parenthesis is an accounting <coughs> uh, sort of property. Accountants use that to show negatives rather than negative signs because they get lost sometimes. Red is nice when there's color, but there isn't always color. So parenthesis means negative to accountants. And then there's also currency. And it works pretty much the same way except dollars. Notice if I click on symbols, all kinds of stuff. Mongolian something or another. I don't know what that is. If there's a different symbol there, notice. Mohawk. I don't know, the Spanish chili, so forth. And you can see you can pick all kinds of things. If we go down far enough, we'll see the euros down here. There's a symbol for euro. But anyhow, we're probably going to use dollars. So if you want to use something else, that's fine. I'll take that. Anyway, so I left the euro or I left some other symbol in there. You get the idea. If I wanted one decimal, I just change this to one. And by the way, Excel will round it using normal rounding rules. Five and up goes up. Four and lower goes down. <clears throat> OK. So format, there's cells. Alignment. Well, horizontal, of course, is left and right. Horizon. And you can do it left, center, right, fill, justify. Center across section is interesting. So what I've done is taken my mouse, clicked on this, and I've highlighted all those columns. Now I'm going to go to Format, Cells, Alignment, Horizontal, Across Section. So it took all these columns and put that number in the center of all those sections. The unusual thing about this is if I go over to where that appears to be, notice up here there's no value. That value actually resides in this cell back here, as you see. All right, But sometimes that comes in handy to center something across more than one row. I'm going to go back and modify that because it's a little confusing for a number. I am just going to make it left. I'm sorry. I'm going to make it right. Numbers should be right normally. OK. And there are some other formats you can look at in there if, you, if you're interested. Alignments, you can wrap text, which I think is what I did in the examples I gave you. So the text, when it comes to the end of the column, it will go down to the next row. You can shrink it to fit, and so forth. Vertical, that's moving it up and down within the cell. Normally you want to do bottom, but there are occasions when you don't. And notice you can tilt it. Tilt it. So I just tilted that one. You normally don't want to do that kind of thing with numbers, but who knows. I'm going to tilt it back to zero. All right. Format again. Cells. You know what font is. Looks exactly like the word font uh, screen. Borders. This allows you to put a box around the cell. And I know it looks like there's a box up here, but these Grid lines on the spreadsheet may not necessarily print, and sometimes you want a different one in totals and so forth. So this allows you to do that. You can put it on the top. This is the top, middle, bottom. Do one across, maybe to cross it off. Here's left, right, across the other way. You get the idea. Whatever you need to do. And then here's the different lines you can do it with, dotted lines dashed lines, you can change the color, and so forth. Patterns, this is how you change the background. I think I asked you to do that on the assignment. So I clicked on this gray thing here and clicked on OK, and notice 
Well, let's take off those borders. And this is sometimes can be difficult to figure out too. None. Okay. Now I have my uh, 75 euros or whatever that is with a gray background to set it off. And that's something you'll need to do in the assignment. Um, rows. We can change the height of the row, but you can do that by dragging too. Just clicking on the end, edge of the cell and dragging it higher, lower, narrower. <clears throat> Interesting, you can hide it though. And sometimes you do that. You have data hidden from the user. You yourself need data to make things happen. Like you'll put interest rates and things hidden, but you want it included. And you lock those fields so they're hidden from view from the people typing the data. But you, the designer, know it's there. You can go in and unhide it and add data when you need to. Sometimes that's very important. Or you want somebody to have access to a spreadsheet. You don't want to create a second spreadsheet, so you just hide things you don't want them to see. Uh, not going to worry too much about the others. Tools. Here's one you better use. I, well, I should use better. I suggest you use the spelling tool. It actually goes through every cell in your spreadsheet and figures out if it's characters and checks the spelling. Very important. Uh, error checking, you can do that to see if you have circular references, which means you have a sum of a sum of a sum or something like that. So you're summing a column, including the sum. So that's a circle. It never ends. <clears throat> um, you can track changes in a spreadsheet. So if you're working in collaborative mode with somebody, you can send them the spreadsheet. When they make changes, it's highlighted, and they send it back to you, and you can see what they've changed. That's a very nice one. Protection. You can say um, protect sheet means nothing changes. Um, protect the workbook. And I'm sorry I missed that term. The workbook is the whole file. The spreads, the sheet is just one of the sheets in the file. I'll look at that in just a second. And you can see allow users to edit only ranges and, and so forth. There's different options there. There's online co collaboration. I'm not going to go into, but you can connect via the web, certain things. There's goal seeking. Uh, I'm not going to go into, but it's there if you ever need it. If you, if you have an assignment or something that allows you or says you need to do that, um, there it is. I'm looking at tools, sorry. Scenarios, formula auditing, macros. A macro is a way to, def to record a set of keystrokes. So you could actually set up file save as control S or something, control F or something. And you can make that work yourself. And then there's options. Um, security, charting, uh, general options here. What to show it's at, uh, what you show at the spreadsheet, <clears throat> objects, page breaks, a lot of things. I'm not going to go into it much. Notice you can go le right to left. Some cultures do that, like Arab cultures. Um, the Jewish uh, written language goes right to left. Japanese goes to, uh, right to left, top or uh, bottom to top. Whatever it is, you can do it now these days. Um, I think that's all we'll look at there. Data, we're not going to talk much, but you can use Excel to keep track of the data like a database. I don't recommend it if you have access to um, Access, Microsoft Access or some other database, but a lot of people do it. And there's a pivot table, and if that comes up, you'll know where it is. I'm not going to go over it here. You can import data. So somebody could give you a bunch of data called perhaps comma-separated data, which means each column in the spreadsheet or each field in the data has a comma after it. <clears throat> and when you bring that in, Excel will put the, the uh, every time there's a comma, it will take the next data and put it in the next column across the top. When it gets to the end to a record, as we call it, it will go down to the next row. So each record is a row and each, uh, between each comma is a column. And it's, th there's a whole lot of other things you can do. You can query a database. Query means ask the database to give you data. We do that with uh, our banner software sometimes. <clears throat> Um, and XML is a type of control language which we're not going to talk about. Window, well notice I have two spreadsheets open. 
One is this one I'm in now with the check mark next to it, and the other is your assignment, and we'll look at that in a minute. I forgot to mention a couple of terms, as I said. If you look at the lower left down here, there's some tabs. Well, this, the defaults on the options for this particular installation of Excel says I want three tabs at the bottom. What those are are what we call worksheets, spreadsheets, I'm sorry. And it goes to different ones. Notice the first one here, it just happens to be named four. Usually they're one, two, three. I was playing around with them earlier. And then that's the one where we did this changes. If you go to the other ones, there's nothing there. I'll go back to four. Well, I'd like to rename four. So I'm going to put the mouse on it, right click, rename. So I'm going to call this Bozo T Nose. Now that's, that worksheet, or I'm sorry, that spreadsheet has a name. Yours, maybe it says inventory, I think. And you might want to, if you're not using these other sheets, I suggest you delete them. So you just have the one. It just uses less space on the disk and so forth, less to keep track of for the software and the disk drive. Um, I can also click on this, right click on both this tab, Insert a worksheet. Boom, I got another one, sheet five. I can take sheet five and slide it after. You get the idea. I left clicked on it and slid it over. So that's an important part of a spreadsheet that people tend to ignore. Those tabs are how you organize one file to have more than one worksheet. And I know this is probably review for a lot of you, but not for all of us. <clears throat> all right. And there's a great help feature function. Um, you can click things in here like, um, I don't know, let's see. Weekly class attendance record. You can actually pull one down off the office, the Microsoft website. There it is. Something to think about. A lot of stuff available there. Okay. Let's take a look real quick at, at your assignment two. If I can find it here. Actually, what I'm going to do is look at the uh, PDF version here real quick. And if this is too small for you, of course, in PDF, you can make it bigger in case you didn't know. And what we have here is a P, I just took my Excel spreadsheet and created a PDF. This, of course, is a columns, right? These are the rows. These are labels. These are all labels. So are these. And we'll look at uh, later <clears throat> where each of these are, but I know that these, the green, oops, so the red are labels, the green <laughs> is data, and we'll say the blue our functions. And there's a few of those here. Those, I believe this column is. Uh, the next two, um, whoops, these, these two are data. I believe the rest of these are formulas. That's your inventory spreadsheet. A little breakdown, if that, that might help. We'll look at this in more detail in a minute. <clears throat> now, if we go
down to the balance sheet, and of course this would be another tab in the same work um, worksheet file or spreadsheet file. And I'm not going to highlight this. You can figure this one out. <clears throat> Notice this is going to be where we format the background. We, we looked at that a minute ago. And of course these are too. The background's green for these. Uh, and it's blue for this one. And as you probably know, by the way, the basic accounting formula or uh, equation is assets equals liabilities. Uh, I'm sorry. Equity equals assets minus liabilities. Or put another way, equities equals, um, yeah, no, I said it right the first time. Sorry. <laughs> Equity equals your assets that you own minus your liabilities. So it's what you own minus what you owe is your equity in your company. And that's kind of what we're looking at here with some formulas worked in here. And these are formulas that you can use to manage your company. I'm not going to go into much detail. I just thought we could use something that's a little more interesting than just a bunch of numbers. And here's your graphs. <clears throat> Bar, column, whatever they're called. Take either one. All right. Now we'll look at the, all this stuff in more detail. For now, I want to look at, here's the spreadsheet, by the way. And notice down here, my three tabs. Right now, I'm on the chart tab, which you can see. I can click on the balance tab balance sheet tab. There's that one. All the way to the top there. Click on the inventory <coughs> column or tab. I'm in my inventory worksheet. And notice I left something off here just so we could go over it real quick. <coughs> the averages. <coughs> I now have placed the cursor in cell B13. And the address is up here, as you can see. OK. Now in that field right here, I want to put an average of all the costs. Very simple to do. You can type an equal sign, average, so forth. Or you can click on Function. I'm going to go to statistical, average. I'm going to say OK. Notice it automatically assumed I wanted to do B2 through B12. It's smart enough to know, well, there's a bunch of numbers up here. I would assume that's what you want to do. If you don't want that, you can change it. But that's fine with me. So I click OK. Boom, I've got my average in there. <clears throat> Notice the formula for the average up here, B2 through B12, so here it is. Well, I also need averages for C, D, E, and so forth. So I could type that in for each one, but there's an easier way, as there usually is. I highlighted B13 again, and you can click on Edit, Copy, or you can do a control C on your keyboard. Either one does the exact same thing. And notice it puts what's called crawling ants or border around that field. And that's the one you copied. I'm going to press the cursor to the right one. Now I'm on C13. I'm going to press Shift, move the cursor to the right, and highlight. This is called highlighting all those cells. I want to paste the average in. Then I'm going to do either edit, paste, or I could do control V as in Venezuela, and it will also paste it. Now I have an average. Well, this is kind of interesting. There's a couple of interesting things here. If I go over to column C, uh oh, something didn't work right. Let's see here.
Let's do that again. I don't know what happened there. Control C. Let me do this one more time. Okay, now it's correct. So column C is C2 through C12. D, and notice the software changed the column number. Didn't change the rows because we want to keep those. It's smart enough to know that. But it automatically changed it. Use that tool. That makes things easier. Notice, however, when you copy, you also get the formatting. So this D13, the formatting is wrong. It's dollars. Well, we want it to be percentage with one decimal. So I'm going to go to Format, Cells, Number, Percentage, One Decimal. I did something wrong. Let's try it again. No, it's correct. I'm sorry, 43.1%. That's correct. OK? One more thing I want to show you here. If I were to um, just delete these for a second. <coughs> What if you want to copy something somewhere else, but you want to keep the same row or the same column or the same exact average? Well, you can do that. I'm going to do it by modifying this average. I'm going to go up here to the top. I clicked a mouse on this, um, on the uh, working box here. And notice when you do that, it highlights down here where that average is related to in a blue box right here. See that? OK. What I'm going to do is use what's called an absolute symbol, which is the dollar sign. Dollar B, dollar 2, and I left the colon alone. The colon indicates range. The range is B2 to B12. In case I forgot to mention that. The so dollar B, dollar 12. What that says is, if I move this formula, don't change any of this stuff, OK? Sometimes you, don't want it, you want it to change the row, but not the column. Sometimes the column. And you just do that by um, where you put those dollar signs. Now this time, if I copy and go over here and paste it, oops, notice they all say 44.47. Because the formulas, watch across the top as I move here, are all the same. They didn't change it. So now you can override the software. Notice down here in the totals, if you watch at the top, the sums change as I move through those. All right. <clears throat> this is review, format, cell to get that background, patterns. And you can see the box down here, the one I used. So let's fix this formula, just so it's correct. I'm going to go up here again to the top. Notice how it highlighted where the average is. I'm going to take these dollar signs out. You could also just add the average back in, but I'm going to do it this way. Then I'm going to copy it. I'm using Control-C. I'll use the Edit Copy. Now I'm going to set the range I want to copy it to by Moving the cursor one to the right, pressing shift, then right, 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 until I get to where I want to be, then edit, paste. Now the values are changed. And the nuisance of it is I got to fix this format here for the percentage again, format, cells, number, percentage, one, OK. There we go. There's our averages. Another reason I mentioned earlier to using formulas, if I click on this cooler one right here, number seven, notice when you click on a row, the whole row is highlighted. If I click on a column, the whole column is highlighted. So if I click on cooler there, I want to add a row. As most things with Office products, you can, there's a couple ways to do that. You can insert a row, or you can do a keyboard thing, which is a uh, um, Alt, Shift, Plus, a little complicated, just do this one. Insert row. Now I have a row there. Now if I go down to this formula, 
Notice it, it is no longer B2 to B12, it's B13. It was smart enough to update that formula because I inserted a row. Normally what I want to do, uh, so let's put some data in here. Bonzo beans cost $44.44. And notice it kept the formatting for us. Uh, the price, 88.88. .88. Markup is 100%. And notice it put the formula in there automatically. It copied that formula down, not the data, the formula. I didn't have to enter that. On hand, beginning quantity, uh, let's say 77. How many did we sell? 33. Notice it, it, it copied the formula and now I'm done. And remember down here, each of these is also changed to G13, or, or column row 13, automatically. Use the formulas. It may seem like a lot of work at, at the beginning, but it saves you time in the long run. All right, good. I want to go through setting up a chart. I'm just going to put the cursor right there. I'll let the computer catch up to me here. I'm going to insert a chart. <clears throat> We're going to go over that real quick. Insert, chart, oh, let's take a bar chart. Notice it's column here, and I said I wanted bar. Well, use column if you want to, excuse me, want to do it like I did it. You can use bar if you want. Column is, is less confusing, but anyhow, I'll choose bar. Next. And by the way, notice there's different kinds of bar charts. There's stacked, 100% stacked, clustered, and so forth. But I'm just going to use this one, the first one. All right. Next. Now it's asking you, well, what data do you want to graph? Chart's another term for graph in my mind. What data do you want to graph? Well, I want to graph something in inventory. So I click on inventory. And I'm going to use the mouse here. I want to graph baseball glove, these two columns. Now notice I didn't pick the totals, I didn't pick the descriptions at the top, the two columns. I picked the two columns because Excel is smart enough to know the first column is the description, the second is the data. And lo and behold, that's what it did over here. It took the first column and, and um, used that to describe what we're graphing. It took the other column as the values. Notice that? Pretty simple. Now I'm going to click on Next. Notice it gives you this example here. Chart title. Well, Bozo Knows Stuff will be the title. Boom, there it is. Category. And notice this is tilted, so your x-axis is where the products are. So just to show you this, you probably wouldn't need to do this. Products, boom, there it is, products. Across the bottom, I'm going to just put a dollar sign. And you can see it put the dollar sign in here. Good. Axes. Notice as I turn this off, notice the x-axis doesn't show you the names anymore. They can turn that off. It's automatic. I can put it to category, which doesn't change it in this case. I can put time scale, and it puts dates, all of today's dates. It's not really what we want to do here. So we'll leave it automatic. The y-axis is the values. I kind of want those, so I'm going to leave those there. Grid lines. Well, the x-axis, uh, we don't need those. You can just play with it. Get it how you like it. The minor ones, what a waste. The Y, we kind of like the grid lines, and the Y allows us to tell values. In fact, let's put the minor ones in there, too, just to help us out. And notice, too, that Excel is smart enough to make the graph just big enough to cover the biggest value. Okay. Let's move across here. Legend. 
Well, I can put the legend on the left. This is the legend right here. It's called Series 1, right, top, corner, bottom. But I'm going to take it off. We don't need it for this graph. Data labels. This is labeling the chart itself, series name. We'll put Series 1, that's the name of the series, on every bar. Well, that's silly. Category name, well, football, horseshoe, well, that's silly. Value, uh, that might have some value if we took the grid lines off. Now you can see the dollar amounts of each of those. Okay. That kind of makes sense. But I don't like it. I'm turning it off. And I'm going to put the grid lines back. Data table. Well, you can show a table of all your data. Probably don't want to do that in this case. Okay, now I'm going to click on Next, and I think I'm done. And you can make it a, a new sheet if you want. And there it is. There's our chart. So if I click off of it, the highlight goes away. Now, everywhere I click on here, I can right-click then and modify it. Right-click on this, modify it. Format axis, format axis title, and so forth. Or if I click somewhere in the general area, I can format chart type. Let's just play around with this. How about it? What's a pie chart look like? There's our pie chart. Eh, have to go through and relabel everything if we did that. What's this one look like? Yeah, okay. Might be valuable. I don't know. But you, this is the what if stuff you can do. I love these things. There's people that can tell you what that means. I don't know what it means. Anyhow, I'm going to switch this back to bar. Remember, you can use column or bar. I prefer column. It makes more sense to me. But if we do that, we probably should change to take those grids off. Looks a little silly in this case. But for now, we'll keep it as a bar. Looks a little better. All right, now there's a couple things you can do with these boxes. You can make it bigger. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Notice, um, whoops, I don't want to move the title. But I could do that just by sliding. Uh, I want to move this down, so I just move that down. Dang it. Mouse just went berserk. All right. Notice, by the way, over here, our labels are only doing every other one because it doesn't think there's enough room. If I make this big enough, it will automatically show everything. It's another way to format what you're doing. So what we've looked at here is we've taken data from a different spreadsheet and graphed it. I want you to compare more than one series of data. And I'll leave that to you. And if you have questions, you can post the questions in the uh, open forum. <clears throat> One last thing to do here, and that is to go over the actual assignment. Relatively straightforward, I think. I tried to make each field um, have a part in the PDF here. Production description, product description, I'm sorry. I want you to use your own test data, at least 15 products. Each row is a product. When we talk about database, we'll talk about a row being a record, columns being fields, but for now, they're columns and rows. And I tell you how to format each. Input data means you type it. Computed means you've got to put a formula or a function in there. And I tell you what it is and how to format each one. Notice formatting is your job. You can copy mine, or if you want to play around, you can do something else. And we'll look at the breakdown on that later. And here's the other one. Company name, balance sheet, enter the date. And right away, you've got a computation there, and so forth. I'm not going to go over every field. There's questions on these open forum. How this distance works is you've got to ask questions. I keep moving off camera, don't I? 
Um, the bar chart, compare inventory total cost at beginning of period to inventory total cost uh, now. That's the first chart. There's two bars in each section, so those are series. If you're having trouble with that, let me know and we can talk about it or I can do another recording if it's a big problem. I just want to leave something for you to figure out. And then there's another chart as well. I want you to do documentation. I think it's an important part of any kind of um, software we create. Because if you create something for people at your work, um, <clears throat> you're a professional. And when you leave, you have to assume you're going to be gone or you're sick or it just gets passed on to somebody else. Well, you should have documentation explaining what it does. And I want you to assume the person knows spreadsheet, knows Excel. Don't explain what Excel is. Assume they know that. <clears throat> just how do you use the spreadsheet? Okay? So assume person reading the documentation has used Excel before. Explain what someone needs to know to use your spreadsheet. What data, what format, what's computed, how is it computed, so that kind of thing. You can put your documentation in another spreadsheet, another worksheet, so there'd be four tabs if you want to do that. Or the bottom of each of the three, explaining it. Um, either way, in the documentation, it doesn't have to be long. Just something somebody can look at to get an idea of how to use your spreadsheet. And finally, the most important part to all of this, I think, <clears throat> this one is the formatting and the computations. Here's the documentation we just talked about, a fifth of your grade. That should be an easy 20% if you do some documentation and you follow the directions. And then what you do with it, what creative you do with it is 10%. And I want to stress this, don't go nuts with the colors. That's the worst thing you can do. People do black and green and red. And, you know, there's some color on what I did, and you can follow that exactly if you want to. That's fine. Um, but if you want to play around, do that too. But black is a bad color in most cases. And a lot of colors is just dis distracting. So keep it simple, and that will help. <clears throat> I think that's all I've got. If you have questions, please um, call, post it in the open forum, whatever you need to do. Contact, communication, it's the way this has to work, all right? <laughs>